I'm Nicola Talent and you're watching Crime World, a podcast about criminals, drugs and the underworld in Ireland and across the globe. Make sure you subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications so you can be the first to watch all our latest episodes. You can also listen wherever you get your podcasts. So if people won't realise the long history that No Long has with sexual offences against women, and the longest history he has, the, uh, you know, of general attitude and violence to women. I mean, his own sister spoke to you and said she was afraid of him since he was she was a young child. Yeah, Noel's sister, Juliana Watkins, um, more Watkins spoke to me last week after mm. he was sentenced to life in prison for the murder of Nora Sheehan. And she spoke to me about how she has been afraid of him her whole life. You know, she was probably the first victim of No Long, right. if not one of the first victims of No Long. Um, he's a few years older than her, um, sh- three years older than her. So she was six um, when she was first realized what a monster her brother was. Mm. You know, she was in her room and he came in to assault her and she fought and kicked and screamed right. and told him, I'll tell my dad. Yeah. And that's when he backed off. And she knew, she said she knew from then that she had to be afraid of him for her life for the rest of her life and she knew not to be alone with him right she's seen him for what he was she said to me I knew he was evil then and I know that he's evil now now she um has spoken to us in the past and she's a very nice woman very very nice and for a very respectable family the, her whole family her extended family she talks lovingly about her own parents they this guy no long didn't come out of an unstable home in fact no, the far exact from opposite it. very loving stable home. Um, but she has kept her sympathies for the Sheehan family, really. She has spoken about her own, I suppose, childhood with her brother, but she's very much kind of insisted that, you know, she was thinking of them as this verdict was brought in. Very much so. Um, she told me that she had cried tears like the rain for mm. the family. You know, she was very cut up by the by the verdict. And um, the kind of the, reala- the realisation that you know, her brother was going to prison finally after all these years for something he's gotten away with for 42 years. And she said to me, it felt like it was justice for the other victims that he's had, which we'll get into. Mm. But, you know, she said that they were in her thoughts. Um, she was really said that she was proud for the family, that they could be proud that they got justice for their mother. Um, she sent a lot of love and compassion to them. She said that she always wanted to have the opportunity to tell them that her sympathy and her you know, her love was with them and mm. not with her brother at all. That He had no support from anyone in his family um, and there was nobody supporting him in court. We've seen that he had his partner with him. Yeah. Um, but other than that, that her, you know, all this time, all she's ever wanted to say yeah. Yeah, is that her love and, and sympathy. It just shows him. how murder tears apart so many families, doesn't it? Absolutely. And generations as well. I mean, he has no long, has sons grown up um, his partner has relatives that will all be marked by this, whether they supported him or not. Um, you know, this is all over the news. This is such a horrific case that came out. I mean, Nora Sheehan was described as a vulnerable woman. She was a mother. She was somebody who had a tendency to flag down cars in the road. And that's why we're describing her as vulnerable, because, you know, I'm sure she was picked up many a time and given a lift by somebody who wasn't a monster. And unfortunately for her, no long came along that night. Yeah, it's believed that she was picked up by four o'clock in the morning um, by no long, taken, murdered, um, sexually assaulted and then dumped in Chapul Woods where her body was found six days later. Like she was. I mean, one of the things that I had spoken to Juliana about was the fact that no long will no longer have any victims. Yeah, he's not going to hurt anyone. Hopefully, again from behind bars. Um, nor Sheehan's death. Um, and you know she kind of Juliana said to me that this woman did not deserve to meet the beast and rapist of Cork City that was no long. Um, you know she's it has torn apart generations of the Sheehan family. She's had kids she didn't get to see grow up, grandkids she's never met, she's never got to, you know, molly coddle and look after. And her, her family described her as somebody who loved kids and loved pets and would have loved to have been around for that. But it has affected 
their families and their relationships. Um, it's affected Noel's family, his relationships um, and the generations of that family as well. So it is kind of, it's been a, the eye of the storm yeah. um, has been no long. And, you know, the, the destruction that he's caused in his life, not just by murdering this woman, but also he's hurt so many it's people. I believe he's got away with it all these years. Okay, he was incredibly lucky back then, you know, in 1981. Because they identified him almost immediately yeah. as the chief suspect. They took his car, they found some fibres in it, they realised that Nora Sheehan had been in his car and they questioned him. And then they brought him, they brought charges against him. They brought charges against him. Um, eventually the Director of Public Prosecutions um, dropped the charges or, you know... Did we establish whether he went to court? He must have gone to court for those charges to be dropped if they were brought against him. Yeah, so there wasn't an all prosecu entered or anything like that. It was simply a case where the DPP said they wouldn't be proceeding with the charges. Right. Um, so a lot of that was down to various different things. But I think one of the main suggestions that was that the pathologist who conducted the postmortem on the body of Nora Sheehan had died. And at that time, there was no way for that evidence to be brought into mm. a trial because the, he was deceased. But we had this Criminal Act, um, Evidence Act in 1992, which is an act which meant um, the evidence of a pathologist could be used in court even after they had died. So he just got away with murder. And he was like, there was other stuff there in the background that he was suspected of. Yeah. So we have, you know, spoken to people who have told us that he's suspected in a, a number of rapes, um, unsolved rapes in the Cork City area. Um, he was brought in and ho holding over the death of Sophie Tuscan de Plantier, which happened in Cork in 1996. Um, I suppose he was just somebody they had to He was a violent at. man. A violent man. Yeah. She died a violent death. However, there was no sexual assault. Mm -hmm. um, Whereas him, there. his MO appears to have been to sexually assault a woman. That seemed to, seems to have been what his driving force were was. Yes. However, Nora died. The murder doesn't seem to have been. Yeah, the murder doesn't seem to have been kind of the motive. Like he didn't mm -hmm. set out. I, I, you know, it didn't seem he set out to kill somebody. Yeah. It kind of seemed he set out to sexually assault, and then it progressed into murder. Whereas with Sophie Tuscan de Plantier, you know, she wasn't a vulnerable woman. Yes, she was in that house on her own mm -hmm. in West Cork. She was killed at the bottom of her driveway with the, I believe, a rock, um, hit on the head with that, and that that wasn't his mo at all. He was. He was his sexual sexual deviant. So he was a person of interest in the case, and there would be hundreds of people of interest, absolutely, in any murder case that they would, you know, identify. The next step up from that is to become a suspect. Yes. Whereas I don't think uh, No Long became a suspect in the Sophie Toscan de Plantier case, but he was certainly a a person of interest. But a year before Nora, she in 1980, he was suspected, or was he? Was he, he was under investigation for another sexual assault was when under Nora investigation died. for um yes for a separate sexual assault um we also find out that the year after he was so and he had 1980 one mm. sexual assault 1981 the death of Nora Sheehan and her sexual assault and then 1982 again the year after he was also under um investigation for that and we heard during legal argument how um the cold case unit wanted wanted that woman to testify against him, not in the Nora Sheehan trial, but to try and get their own prosecution for right. that rape. But um, she emailed them after kind of a lot of back and forth. She was raped while in Cork on holidays. She's from the UK, England, I believe. And she kind of got to the point where she just emailed and she said, I don't want mm -hmm. anything to do with this anymore. Obviously, that's extremely, re you, mean, you know what I mean? She, they were coming back after 30 years yeah. and bringing up all that trauma again. And exactly. you, know, it's, you it's might not really want the court case and to have the whole, you know, maybe she's managed to park that or compartmentalize what happened yeah. or whatever. Um, and that's the problem, I suppose, all along police have in particular with these sexual predators because, you know, you have to give up a lot of yourself to accuse them. And to go through a court case, that's what people, uh, you know, victims' voices always talk about, mm -hmm. that they're almost victimised again as part of the the legal system, unfortunately. But um, I mean, we're delving into really bits of what he's done, but like he was only a young man in his early 30s when Nora Sheehan died. And where do you go from that as a sex offender? Where do you go from that as a sex offender who has also just gotten away with murder? Yeah. You know, um, Surely there was a sense of, oh, I can do, you know, I can get away with it once. We mm -hmm. don't know if there's other um, victims of of him. We certainly know he has other 
women he sexually assaulted. His convictions in relation to um, one woman in particular who was described as having sort of special needs and I think he lured her into the car seems to be always the yeah. vehicle seems to be involved. And certainly in, in the bits we know, the vehicle seems to be part of it. Um, you know, when you have somebody targeting vulnerable woman, women, again, there's another layer of protection for themselves there. Yeah. Do they speak up? Do they have the wherewithal to be able to complain, to make a complaint? So even now it's hard enough to prosecute a rape, but I can only imagine back then mm. the fact that women were kind of, there's a lot of victim blaming now that, you know, it's the woman's fault. There was cases where women's underwear, what they were wearing when they were raped, held up in court. Um, I can only imagine what it was like 40 years ago. Yeah. You know, that kind of misogyny, we still haven't kind of gotten away from that blaming of the woman. Um, so to even know that you have that kind of silence on your side then, mm -hmm. it's... Now, no Long was an avid motorbiker and he was a guy who liked to dive and he had friends in both those areas. But he also was functioning, like he wasn't kind of like the sort of um, sex attacker, I suppose, that you, you see as being this kind of loner or anything. He was actually married when... Nora Sheehan died yeah. and his wife remained with him for some time afterwards and he had two children and he's been in a long term relationship since his 50s with um, the partner who was with him in court supporting him. So he's been living amongst a community as a seemingly ordinary guy while, you know, practicing these these sort of dark sex attacks on women as well. Yeah, like I suppose that's the sort of thing. That's how men like that get to their victims because they seem so normal, because you trust them, because they're not ugly monsters that you mm. might see creeping down alleyways. They're just everyday human people who, you know, either they pull over and try and help you on the side of the road and you don't kind of, and that's how they lure people in. Um, especially with him, you know, he was able to lure in these vulnerable people. So maybe he was too much of a coward, um, you know, to, to, be that way with with people in his life because it seemed like his victims were random. And mm -hmm. um, we've certainly heard, you know, obviously we have Juliana who has her story with what happened to him, an opportunistic yeah. person, exactly, which is what happened with Nora Sheehan. Um, we have heard of other stories where, you know, th there is other people mm -hmm. without a doubt that he has had um, assaulted. Yeah. Um, but, you know, he is, he is behind bars now and he's yeah. not going to harm another woman. Do you know what I have to say? Like, a lot of these cold cases are what the cold case, the serious crime review team is identify the suspect. The suspect may not have been identified before. They may have been there somewhere in those files. But with the no long case, the state took an awful long time to actually bring him before the courts. Mm -hmm. I mean, the legislation changed in the 90s. The cold case team was set up in 2008. Nothing was happening since then. The fibres and the DNA were sent to a lab 2010. Yeah. So, I mean, I know he brought this up himself in his, his in legal argument, but I mean, it seems to me it's a bit tardy when you have somebody as uh, dangerous as him living out in the community and feeling so empowered by having got away with it for so long. You'd wonder, like, what, what was the big delay? I mean, it's 13 years after that, those fibres and the DNA, which clearly or what convinced the jury of his guilt were were sent to those labs in the UK and came back. So it seems, well, yes, that was something he brought up in his legal mm. argument himself, kind of that delay and the the fact that you're kind of have the right to a speedy trial. Um, what seems to have happened was the cold case review team wasn't actually put in place until 2008. So there was no way of, you know, there being, a, a, there was no dedicated team of, mm. of Gardaí to actually invest, investigate those cold cases. So that's, you know, kind of was it the main thing. fell through the thing. cracks as such because it was so old. fell through the cracks and because it was so old. And again, the Guardi kind of said this during the trial was that if a fresh murder investigation opens up, they have to put all their resources into that because as you know, with these things, time is of the essence, you know, with witnesses mm -hmm. and interviewing um, witnesses and, you know, suspects and getting evidence, gathering evidence that that kind of takes precedent. Um, another thing was, you know, with the serious crime review team, when they did get that case file, you know, they went through and they identified about 200 cases from, I think, 1980 was about their cutoff point. Um, I think there might have been just one previous to that, but they had 200 cases to review and it was a very small team of people mm. who had to review those. So you can imagine, 
you know, you're starting off into an investigation that's that old, that the amount of evidence they had to go through, they were trying to find all the witnesses, track them down, interview them themselves. And, you know, they had to find out whether they were living abroad, whether they were still here, if they were dead, if they were, you know, still able to give that evidence and to have to go around all those people, Mm. comb through all the evidence that's there with not just one case, but all of the cases. And, you know, Obviously, all of different time, complexities. I mean, you're kind of worried as each year goes by that somebody mightn't be around to sit in the the witness box and give the evidence, you know. Mm. Um, but it just did strike me that this case is different. It's different to the others. He was there from the beginning. It's a suspect. It was luck on his part that he got away with it. And could those fibers and et cetera been sent between 92 and, you know, 2010? when they were like, that's at nearly 20 years that nobody thought to look back over this case. There's so many forgotten victims of, out there. And I was once told by somebody who worked on the cold case unit that it's those who shout loudest that get heard. So it's people who have family fighting for them. And, you know, some families don't have the ability to campaign. And I suppose sometimes they just, you know, they're not able to cope with what's happened and, mm. and that kind of thing. But yeah, it's it's uh, it just strikes me that there was it's it's definitely a big long delay. I mean, mm. he was still an able bodied man until he was jailed there at now Juliana says he's actually aged seventy six, not he's uh, 80, sorry, yeah, he's seventy five, head for seventy six, not seventy four. So it kind of does make a difference when you're that age. Yeah, seventy five years of age. So that legislation changed in ninety two. So he was at that point only forties. Mm. And he's lived out his 40s, his 50s, his 60s and most of his 70s as a free man. Yeah. Despite being identified as the killer of Nora Sheehan so long ago. But anyway, um, and, you know, for somebody as dangerous as that living in the communities, in the community, um, that's what the police are there for, to protect the community, to do their job. And you would wonder, should we be celebrating this as an achievement or as one that's just too long coming? I don't know, just putting it out there. Yeah, like it obviously it has taken such a long time. And again, this is something that came up at trial. Um, but then it seems to be the issue was also surrounding um getting a legal sample, DNA sample from no long because they didn't actually have one because they took a blood sample back in 1981, but because that arrest was also deemed right. to be illegal because he was questioned about the murder while being arrested for the burglary. Um, they had to also try and, that's why they wanted to get that victim from 82 to okay. proceed with her. With her so they um, had something fresh to put to so him. They had something fresh to put to him and they had a way of kind of maybe obtaining a legal DNA sample mm. for, from him. Um, but that didn't come around until 2021 um, when they got a warrant to search his house and take possessions from him. Um, that might explain things. In that yeah. Case. He was, and just some people can be lucky and they know how to work the system. And he obviously is an agitator, as I know myself. And he's somebody that will be sitting in jail working out how he can appeal this, no doubt. He never accepts his fate. No, and I think one of the really interesting things that I came across while I was kind of in the course of this trial was when he he has a conviction for 2014 for assault. Mm-hmm. Um, and we know he's obviously a very violent man, but when the judge in that case was handing down the sentence or when he throughout the course of the trial, he said... Um, It is somewhat extraordinary to have a 65-year-old man before the court for assault. Normally, assault is the province of young, hot-blooded, hot-tempered and the foolish. Um, And he basically said that um, there is a question of a lad having a short fuse and then there's your lad who doesn't have any fuse at all, which I thought described him down to the ground. It It is so odd to have somebody of that age losing the cool, losing the rag. I think a guy had driven down um, the lane outside his house. Something unfolded. He put a basically a water hose into the car to soak him. The man got out of the car and he was, you know, in a completely unprovoked attack, mm. hit with an iron bar. And there was no remorse there either for that incident. No control over his temper whatsoever. No. And we know of other incidents even happening later in his life where he still um, was a volatile character ready to flip off the handle um, at any point. Um, well, look, we'll, we'll come back to him again as we kind of continue to delve into his background and try and put a few pieces of the jigsaw together. His ears must be burning, but we will be back to it. Indeed. Thank you, Clodagh. Thank you.